Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Michaela Clauser. I'm the Director of Producer Education here at NCBA, and uh, we're so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Just a couple quick housekeeping items. As a participant, your line will be muted, but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar. And at the end of the presentations, we will get to as many of those as time will allow. If you are having trouble with your technology or if you are joining us only for the audio, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing in a few days at ncba.org. Just check out the producer tab on the website. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by the National Corn Growers Association, and we have Michael Granche on here with us to speak on the importance of the cattle and corn partnership. We always love collaborating with corn growers and appreciate their continued support. So, Michael, I'm going to pass it off to you for a few, uh, for a few words. Thank you so much, Michaela. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Granche, and I currently serve as the manager of market development for the National Corn Growers Association. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you all tonight, and um, I'm looking forward to learning alongside uh, each and every one of you with our incredible presenters. So NCGA is so proud to be the sole sponsor of the Cattlemen's Education Series, which is a grant-style funding program that provides dollars for state cattle associations to offer educational opportunities in collaboration with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. So Michaela, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Thanks, Michael. Tonight's webinar um, will feature, tonight's webinar titled Winter is Coming, uh, Are You Ready? will feature doc, Dr. Carla Wilkie. Dr. Wilkie is a Cal-Calf Stalker Management Specialist for, U, for the University of Nebraska, located at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scotts Bluff. Her research includes maintaining production cow-calf pairs in confinement to provide grazing deferment for range while maintaining a core herd from liquidation or as part of a system to reduce dependency on perennial pasture. Additionally, she evaluates alternative, alternative uses for crops such as field peas or sugar beets and beef cattle diets when they are rejected for human consumption. Since her appointment in 2009, she has conducted numerous supplementation studies for grazing yearlings. Currently, she is evaluating marketing and supplementation strategies for stalker grazing programs. Uh, tonight's webinar will also feature Dr. Maggie Justice. Dr. Justice joined the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture System as an assistant professor for beef cattle and a beef cattle extension specialist in May 2023. Her focus areas include beef cattle husbandry and integrated resource management for beef forage systems. She also serves as the Arkansas Beef Quality Assurance State Coordinator. Dr. Justice is a native of South Carolina where she grew up on her family's commercial beef cattle operation. Her love for the industry was born out of working on the farm and being active in the 4-H livestock and equine program. Dr. Justice earned her bachelor's and master's degree in animal science at Clemson University and her PhD in beef cattle management and nutrition from Auburn University. Uh, thank you both for being here with us. And Dr. Wilkie, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you. X out of stuff that doesn't need to be making noise while we're doing this and start this slideshow. Okay, I just appreciate everybody for taking time um, from their busy schedules to get on the webinar. Um, so I was asked to talk about the um, northern side of things. And so um, that's kind of where I'll go with this. Um, most of the cow herds in the Northern Plains are spring calving cows, which then means that in the winter time, when we are probably on dormant native range or corn stock residues or something like that, the majority of those cows are probably no longer lactating. The calf has been weaned, they're hopefully bred, and um, they are probably in about a middle third of their gestation, second trimester, if we're talking that they're going to be on this residue or dormant range from November to January and they're a, a April calving cow. So um, if they don't need to gain anything, if they just need to maintain, then they would need about 11 pounds of TDN or total digestible nutrients 
and about a one and 1.6 pounds of crude protein. If we assume that this low quality forage is about 6% crude protein and 52% TDN, then if that cow could eat 22 to 23 pounds of dry matter, that's calculating the moisture out of it, um, then, um, and she probably could do that on this, then, then it would supply um, enough TDN and pretty close to enough crude protein um, to meet her needs. So probably no supplementation would really be needed assuming that um, she had as much to eat out there as she, as she needed. The last third of gestation, so maybe for this cow, it's April to or February to April. Um, we're still, she'd probably eat more than 22 pounds of dry matter if she had access to it, but we're going to assume that we have limited access and or limited digestibility. The thing about winter forage is that unlike in the summer when we're grazing and maybe we're doing some rotational grazing and it rains and we get some regrowth, you kind of got what you got um, in dormant range and and corn stock residue, you may be able to move them to a field that you haven't been grazing, but you're still going to just start with that initial amount of residue that we were assuming. Um, there's not going to be any regrowth, and, and the likelihood is that as they graze, the less available, after they've picked through it, you know, the less um, nutrients are available. But if we were still assuming that she was just going to eat 22 pounds of dry matter of that same forage and it was holding at that same um, crude protein and TDN, now because her requirements have increased because of the late gestation needs of that fetus, now we're a little short of, of what she actually needs and she's most likely going to lose weight on that. If we decided to feed two pounds of dried distiller's grains on a dry matter basis, and so we we held that 22 pounds constant, but we said, okay, 20 of those pounds are going to be from forage now, um, and so then we would be getting a little over 10 pounds of TDN from the forage, 1.2 pounds of crude protein. If we're assuming that distiller's grains is 100%, 108% TDN and 30% crude protein, then that two pounds adds enough TDN to get her up to 12.6 and enough crude protein to get her at 1.8. So she's probably going to meet her needs on that, um, assuming that maybe the addition of the, the, the nitrogen in the crude protein is going to maybe increase her intake a little bit or the digestibility and therefore the intake. Um, but at a minimum, she's probably going to do a pretty good job of holding her own there. That being said, there's this is what I'm showing you now is um, the results of a five year study that was conducted at the University of Nebraska where um, March calving cows were um, grazed on corn stock residue from October to February. So mid gestation through um, about halfway through late gestation and um, those cows started out in a body condition score of 5.4 on a one to nine scale, so pretty moderate, and they were either supplemented or they were not. And um, change in body weight doesn't mean a whole lot because the fetus is growing, so obviously there's gonna be um, some, some increase there, but change in body condition score, the cows that were not supplemented still came in um, holding their own at a, the 5.4. Whereas the cows that were supplemented bumped up a little bit to a 5.6, but still just in that moderate between five and six range. So they followed those cows through for um, when they started cycling, their pregnancy rates, um, calving interval, you know, did they get bred later in the season, what birth weight, calf weaning weight, and they really didn't get any differences in those measurements that actually make you the money, right? The when you sell the calf, got an early a calf earlier in the season, that kind of thing. So the supplementation in that particular situation um, in that five-year study really didn't pay to do that because those cows didn't have any differences in the pregnancy rate or the birth weight or timing of, of calving. That, that kind of depends on a couple of things that we're going to talk about now. Okay, so it's assuming that those cows are able to root down and dig through um, the snow, which they will do uh, if it's not crusted over. 
So it's assuming that that, um, that feed is still out there throughout that time period and that the cows can still get access to it. So corn stalk residue and dormant range grazing works really great without supplementation until it doesn't. If you can't find the waterer, they probably can't find the feed. So that slide is maybe um, a little extreme, but um, it, it makes that point, right? That what we're assuming when we put those cattle out there on dormant native range or, or corn stalks in the winter is that they do in fact have access to the feed that's out there. Um, Eastern Colorado, Western Nebraska, Southern Wyoming this last winter really had a horrible, horrible winter with a lot of deep snow. A couple of winters before that, pretty open winter, kind of got lulled into to sleep and there was some people that came home with cows that were probably too thin um, to make it, uh, to either do a good job raising the calf that they were carrying uh, and then to rebreed with the next calf because they just couldn't recover from that. So it's just, it's something that we, we need to think about. We can't just assume that this is what we always do. Um, every year is going to be different and we need to be cognizant of that and be watching for changes that we might need to make in the middle of the, the season. The other thing that that five-year study um, kind of assumes is that you've got some time now. They brought those cows in in February. They didn't keep till March, so they, they had a month there to do something different on that. The other question becomes for us in the Northern Plains is spring on the calendar doesn't necessarily equate to green grass in the Northern Great Plains, right? So how long is it from the onset of lactation to green grass? That's really a critical question for our winter feeding programs because as we're going to see, uh, there's a lot that happens due to lactation and um, we need to know, you know, if that cow needs to be in a moderate condition, holding her own, does she have an opportunity, you know, can she afford to lose a little bit, does she have an opportunity to make some of it up, and every system's going to be different. So those are questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Um, probably not just for our operation, but also from year to year because um, things are always different in beef cattle production. So the other question that we have to then ask ourselves is, well, how much does lactation change her needs, really? And I think if you ask any producer on this call, they would say, well, yeah, it, it changes it. But sometimes we don't realize the magnitude of that change, and that's what can get us in trouble at times. So I, I made a graph. And I, I just thought maybe this visual would help us depict, you know, what is really going on with her. So um, the gray bars are her TDN requirement or what is provided and the red is crude protein. So over on the left, we have that late gestation need that we just talked about, the 13 pounds of um, TDN and the 1.8 um, pounds of crude protein she needs during late gestation. The next set of bars shows you what she needs for early lactation. And I probably should have said this earlier, but I'm assuming this is like a 12 to 1300 pound cow. So um, you, can, you can see, you can visualize how much more energy and protein she really needs simply due to lactation. So what happens a lot of times is um, during that late gestation period, producers say, well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm feeding this hay and, and I'm supplementing, you know, with a um, pound and a half of cubes or, you know, whatever it is. And then when she goes into lactation, um, when we're waiting to go to grass, I, I, up the, I, I save my best meadow hay and then I feed, I increase my distiller's grains supplement to three pounds a day or whatever. So when we look at that, if that's what we're doing, and we put in some really good quality hay and we put in that um, three pounds of distillers, what we see is that it certainly does increase what we're providing over what she needs for late gestation, but it doesn't actually meet her needs for what she needs in early lactation. If we look at the last bar over there, that's looking at some really good quality um, early grazing, you know, um, veg very vegetative grazed green grass in June that she might be on. And you can see from that that it she's probably not only going to meet her needs for lactation, but she's probably going to 
actually maybe put on a little weight because it's actually a little more than she she needs. Fantastic. Uh, the, the problem or the question that you have to ask yourself is um, how much time is going to elapse between the meadow hay and the three pounds of distillers that's not quite meeting her needs and when I can actually go to grass with her. Um, and what is her body condition when she goes into early lactation? Because I need to know, does she have enough to give a little? Because during that, before I can go to grass, she's probably gonna lose a little condition on me. So does she have it to give? And then how, how long are we actually talking about? And the thing that can trip us up sometimes is um, maybe it's been dry and um, we're having to delay turnout. So now those cows are in the lot longer than we'd like for them to be. And so they're starting to slip on us a little more than we would like. Uh, maybe we're in a confinement situation. We're not going to grass at all for one reason or another. And so um, we, we got to make that adjustment there. So um, if, if we're going to grass pretty quick there and she's lost a little condition, but she's now on an inclining plane of nutrition because of the grass, she's going out with the bulls, um, you know, things may be great. When, when we get delays or hitches in our system is when sometimes we need to be cognizant of what's really going on with that cow because now we may have to make an adjustment somewhere. So the other thing that brings up then uh, in my mind is evaluating body condition um, in the winter. And, and that can be a little bit deceiving, but it's something that we probably need to do a better job of, all of us really, um, of, of trying to do it. But it's also important to notice that in the winter, these cows can be kind of fuzzy and um, they can, um, you know, that their hair can, keep us from really evaluating what's actually there. Um, but this particular cow on a scale of, of one to nine system that we typically use in the beef world would, would probably be about a six. Um, she has got a fuzzy coat, but you know, there's, there's clearly some um, lack of definition in those pin bones. Um, if you look over her tail head, uh, it's not real, um, angular or protruding. Um, if you look at her rear end there, it's not sharply angular. Um, you know, the bone's not real evident there. If you look over her front ribs, you can see there's some cover on the actual front ribs. The other thing that can be deceiving in the winter besides a fuzzy hair coat could be that um, because they're on low quality forage and it doesn't have a real high passage rate, they can have a really um, big gut. And so it, you, you could be thinking that they're in really good condition because they look fat, but it's just still in the gut. And if we're not looking at where the fat cover should be, we could miss that. Same thing could be um, if the cows um, didn't have much gut fill and we thought, oh my goodness, we really need to be feeding these cows more when in fact they, they did have the fat cover. Another good place to look for cover is on the in the brisket. In this particular picture, you can't see it because calf's rear end's in the way, but um, that's another good place to look. So I, I would probably call this cow a six. If I looked at this cow, I'd probably say she was a five. You see, if you compare the two cows, you see that there's a little more definition in the pin bones on this cow. You can see there's not a lot of fill in her brisket. Um, you can kind of see, her um, spinal column, you know, down her back, you can kind of see that it's there. You don't see it real, a uh, lot of definition to it. You see more definition around her tail head than you did the other cow. Um, she clearly does have a little more angular look to her um, hindquarters, if you could see that. If you actually put her in the chute and put your hands along her back, you could feel the spacings along her spinal column there. Um, but still, we'd call those two, the five and the six, you know, the moderate. So that's where we're hoping they're staying throughout the winter. So let's talk a little bit about why body condition scoring um, or the, why the body condition score they have at calving is so important. So this is some old data, but it still holds um, pretty true in that um, the pregnancy rate uh, 
is is impacted by body condition. And this is on a 90 day breeding season. I think most of us do a 45 or a 60. And so that just makes it all the more important that um, those cows be in a five or six to get the pregnancy rates that um, that are gonna help us be uh, have a good uh, production system. We don't want that 50%. The other thing that's really important is that what it also correlates with body condition score of the cow is immunoglobulins uh, that are produced in the colostrum for the immunity of the calf. So this graph shows serum IgG levels in the in a 24-hour baby calf. So that's taking a blood sample from the calf and comparing um, how much immunoglobulin is in the system after they nurse the cow when the cow was a, in a body condition score to up to six, I believe. So um, there's probably, a com this is probably a little bit confounded. There's probably two things going on here. One, the thinner cow didn't produce as high a quality colostrum during that time prior to the baby being born during that development period. And two, we all know that a really thin cow will give birth to a small weak calf. And so he probably didn't get up and get an enthusiastic meal and didn't get that um, immunoglobulin in there very quickly. What we also know from the dairy side of things is that the longer you wait uh, for milking postpartum, the less of that immunoglobulin is actually there. That, that concentration begins to dissipate. So if this calf is weak and slow because his cow was thin and he doesn't get up and get what she has and she doesn't have much then we're just we're having a snowball effect so that's the other reason that it's really important that we come through the winter as best we can and there's many cows in that five and six range so i haven't talked a lot about vitamins and minerals i've talked a lot about protein and energy and that's not to say that i don't think the vitamins and minerals are important for immunity and in reproduction they very much are and um in my part of the world the 2022 was such a horrible drought it was about the third year of drought and um we had to pull cows off of grass early the grass didn't have a lot of quality and they immediately went on harvested residues and byproducts don't have a lot of vitamins and minerals in them um, a lot of those things they might normally have in the diet and store in the liver for later use they probably didn't get so i think it's very important that we do supplement those but i i didn't make a really big deal out of them because a lot of times when i have questions on this and people say well i must be i need a better mineral program i must be short some minerals because i don't like what my breed up was when i go back and back calculate through some things um they're shorter on protein and energy than they are vitamins and minerals and so it's not that they aren't important but if you are short on protein and energy it doesn't matter how high quality a vitamin and mineral program you have that's not really where your first limiting your rate limiting step you might call it is and so improving the the uh, vitamin and mineral package when you have a protein and energy shortage is kind of like putting a band-aid on a cut that needs about six stitches. It really didn't do a whole lot of good. It might have helped some, but it really didn't solve the issue. So just to reiterate that importance, what event has to happen right after peak lactation? They have to cycle and rebreed. And um, so that event right there is set up by all these things that we're talking about in the winter and um, just prior to calving, even if it is a spring calving. So just wanted to um, once again make that point because um, we we get in some pickles there. So let's talk a little bit about supplementing the weaned calf that might be grazing residue on dormant range. This is um, a, a, some data that was compiled that was done, several studies that was done at the University of Nebraska on supplementing the growing weaned calf. And so, Basically, some of those studies had a negative control, and I will tell you that if you do not supplement a growing calf on like corn stock residue, that kind of thing, that calf loses weight, and that doesn't do you any good. Some people think that they want um, a very low rate of gain on the winter gain because they want to take advantage of compensatory gain when the calf then goes to grass in the spring, and that does make sense, 
However, I'm going to show you some data that would suggest that we really want to, instead of targeting half a pound a day gain, we want to be targeting about uh, a pound 50. And to do that, um, what we have found, what this graph shows you, is that about 0.6% of body weight on a dry matter basis um, will, of, of dried distiller's grains would get you about that one and a half pound a day gain. And so for a 500 pound calf, that'd be about three pounds on a dry matter basis is about what we would want to do. And so this is the reason. So this is a meta-analysis of several studies of winter supplementation where the gain was either low at half a pound a day gain or high at one and a half. And putting those studies together, then you can see that the ending body weight was um, obviously greater, as was the rate of gain during the winter. Then you go to the summer grazing and you look at that average daily gain and you see that there certainly was some compensatory gain because those that had been on a low rate of gain during the winter had a greater average daily gain, 1.34 versus 1.06, um, in the summer. But what you also notice with the ending body weight there is that those calves never did completely catch up to the calves that were on the higher rate of gain in the winter. They only compensated 37%. When they followed all these calves and all these studies on through the finishing phase, they find that um, those calves that were supplemented a little higher rate of gain during the winter um, held that advantage clear to the finishing phase. So something to think about in the winter, uh, wintering, backgrounding those calves in the winter, that um, that may be uh, a little greater, a pound and a half is still not a large amount, it's not like two or three pounds a day gain, but um, a little more than just half a pound a day gain uh, was probably going to net you more return than, than the half. So the, another group that we need to talk about on corn stock residue is pears. So um, we're gonna look at a study that was done with summer born, so July, August born um, pears. And they were, uh, we had a study at the, on the eastern side of Nebraska and then out, of, out on the western side in the panhandle. And then the CS is corn stalk grazing, DL is a dry lot. So we compared taking the pairs to corn stalks versus dry lot. And um, so we look at the cow body condition score. And so again, we see that these cows were between that um, five and six, right in that mid range. So they were in good shape when they went out there. But the cows on corn stalks in both um, locations lost some body condition during that time, even though um, the pears were being supplemented 5.2 pounds um, dry matter basis of just dried distillers grains. And now that's for pear. There's no way to there was no way to separate out. You know, here's what's for the cow and here's what's for the calf. So it went to the pear. But when we look at how that impacted the cow, really didn't see any differences in pregnancy rate, but they did. Um, uh, maintain weight a little better in dry lot than they did out on the corn stalks. When we look at the calf performance, we also see that the calves out on corn stalks didn't perform quite as well as the calves that were in dry lot. So the average daily gain um, was uh, 1.3 or 1.54 versus over two pounds a day gain for the dry lot calves, whether you were looking at the eastern or the or western side. So the calves did a little better in the dry lot, but as far as a system goes, economically, the calves on the corn stalk grazing netted more return than the dry lot because of the cheaper inputs of the corn stalk grazing system versus the cattle being on a TMR in the dry lot. So something else to, to think about that group. Last group I'm gonna talk about is the herd bull the forgotten investment. Um, how many times do we put our herd bulls out in a pasture for the winter in the bull pasture uh, because they're done with their job for the year and leave them out there? Um, we, uh, we invest an incredible amount of money in our bulls for our herd. And so it would probably be a wise investment on our part to make sure they had wind breaks, when um, temperatures are extremely frigid, some bedding um, to keep them from having frostbite on the testicles, which can then cause them to fail their breeding soundness exam the next spring. Um, keeping them in a body condition score of five to six as well can certainly improve their longevity and the quality of the semen that they are producing. 
Um, I, at the bottom of this slide, I, I put down a link, extensionpublications.unl.edu. There's a little search bar. Once you get there, if you type in that G2332 and then hit search or whatever, um, hit the little magnifying glass. It should bring up a NEB guide that talks about some um, ration options for the bulls and some different management things that we might want to consider um, for our bulls as well. So as far as um, the northern plains and the winter feeding, that is all I have. All righty, are y'all ready for me, Michaela? Yep, you are good to go. All righty. So, um, kind of, kind of building off of of what we just went through um, for the for the central and northern central part of the United States, the, it's it's going to be a little bit different in terms of what we're feeding here in the southeast and the central south part of the United States. But a lot of the the same terms apply, especially when we're thinking about our herd. One second. And so. So one of the most important things we can think about with our herd is that nutrition doesn't come in a bag. There are a lot of great uh, feeds out there that we can get from the store that, that are going to meet us in, in the feed trough and make sure that our herd is getting what it needs. But that's not the only thing we can think about. We need nutrition as far as everything goes to make sure our animals have a healthy body. They're breeding and rebreeding like she just spoke on milk production's happening and and the growth that we need from our animals as well and so steps to feeding when we think about our winter feeding plan we can think about it in four simple steps but there's a lot more to it so first we've got to determine our animals needs and make sure that we are meeting their requirements Everything she just went she just went over is exactly the way we're going to think about it here in the southeast. What stage of production are you in? What is your herd's body condition score as we're going into the winter? Then we're very fortunate in the southern part of the United States that we can grow a lot of different forages almost year round. So what is your forage base looking like as you're going into the winter and how much of it do you have? Then we're going to make sure that we're matching our forage to our animals' needs, and then we're going to determine what we're deficient in, and then use that to, to make our supplementation plan. So when we're meeting the needs of our herds, we've got to think about what our operation goals are. Are we a fall calving system in which our cows are going to hit peak lactation during those January and February cold, wet, muddy months? Or are we just trying to get our dry cows through the winter and into the next spring? Or are we looking at raising some stalkers this winter and we've got to put a couple pounds a day on them? What are our goals and where are our animals at in the production stage? Thinking about our herd's BCS score, what are we going into? Do we need to put weight on them? Or are we just trying to maintain that good body condition score before we rebreed them? Then thinking about what our forage and roughage quality is, this is the basis of everything we're going to do. That forage can meet us at the table and be enough, or it may not be. And that's how we're going to pick our feed supplementation and depending on the feed quality, it's going to help us out. So we think about the changing nutritional requirements of our herd. Of course, those newborn calves are gonna be at the top of the needs list as far as our animals go, but they're getting a lot of their nutrition from their dam. So we don't have to worry about them as often. All the way going down to our dry cows. Those are the girls that if we've got some good quality hay, we may not need to worry about them as much. But what we have to think about is what's going to happen to our herd as this weather changes on us if we think about last winter especially here in the southeast in december one day we were sitting in 75 degree weather and a couple of days later we were hitting colder temperatures that we hadn't seen in a long time and everything was freezing over and so we have to recognize 
that our needs are going to change for our animals and we have to be there helping them out in those changes. And so I'm not going to go through this chart completely because it was a lot, a lot of what Carla just talked about. But if we think about the needs of our mature, dry, non-lactating cattle, a lot of times, like I said, our forage is really going to meet them at the table and help us out in getting them what they need. But we need to focus in on making sure that we are meeting these total digestible nutrients or our energy needs for our animals, as well as our crude protein needs as well. And so how does that change exactly when they do go into that lactating phase? And so if we look here at this thousand pound, um, thousand pound cow, when she went from being a dry cow eight months post calving to now being two months post calving in, in peak lactation, she just went from needing around 20 pounds a day of dry matter to now 25 pounds a day of dry matter. That's a, that's a big jump up. And if we aren't paying attention to our herd and recognizing when these changes are happening, we could find ourselves in, in an accident that we don't want to be in. Another important note to take is a lot of times we don't think about the differences in the weight of our herd, but that also matters. So not saying we need to know the exact weight of every animal in the pasture, but knowing an average of what your herd weighs is also going to help you make some of these large feeding decisions here in the winter. Take this 1,000 pound cow versus our 1,400 pound cow. There's a five pound different needs in dry matter intake per day. And so if we're just assuming that our cattle weigh about a thousand pounds because it's easy math to do while we're sitting in the feed store, when in reality our herd probably weighs on average about 1400 pounds, that's five pounds a day for one animal that we're messing up on. So knowing what phase of production our animals are in, knowing their body condition score, and knowing about what their weight is, is really gonna help us in the long run when making these nutrition decisions. And so, like I said, when we're in the, the central south and the southeast portion of the United States, we're very fortunate in the fact that we have a strong forage base. And so when we're going into the winter, we've got to think about, are we going to be utilizing some grazing during these colder months, or are we going to stick to a conserved forage, or is it going to be a mixture of both? And so we have a lot of options. We think about our stockpiled forages right now, especially here getting close to Thanksgiving. A lot of guys are probably on that last leg of our warm season forages that we might have stockpiled, like our Bermuda and our Bahia grass. Our tall fescue's probably just finished finishing its growing phase and we'll be able to hold on to those stockpiled forages. This also might have been a fall that you were able to plant some cool season annuals and that, that grazing time will be upon us. I was in South Arkansas today looking at some annual ryegrass that was planted in October and it needs a couple more weeks and it'll be at perfect grazing height. The best part about some of these forages is that they are going to meet the nutritional requirements of our cattle herd and that's great. We might need just a little bit of supplementation or we might not need any at all. The big kicker here, in this, especially in the southeast coming into the winter months, is that we have had a dry fall. We are coming out of um, some, some drought, in, especially in September and October, when our guys would have been going through their last hay cutting or would have been trying to plant some of these cool season annuals. So in just a few slides, that'll be something we address big time and how that outlook's going to look for us in the winter. But our conserved forages that we typically depend on are going to be our hay, Baleage has become more popular in recent years, and as well as some of our silage that some guys still utilize as well. And so what is the most important thing you can do with your forage, whether it's grazing or it's that conserved forages like our hay, is going to forage test. Okay, that forage test is going to help us to determine the nutrient levels in our forages and eliminate some guesswork. I don't have to tell most of this audience that, that feed is expensive these days. And so if we test our forages and find out that maybe we didn't need to feed a bunch of feed, that's great. That's going to save us some money in the long run. But we also don't want to take guesswork at our hay because a lot of times our hay does not quite pan out on the nutrient levels that we think it's going to. So making sure that we're matching the forage to our feed supply and our animals' needs is important. 
Here in the state of Arkansas, I know that a forage test cost $18. That's $18 that could save you a lot of money and is so important in helping us build our, our nutri nutrition plan. And so again, I'm, I'm going back to how great our forages are um, and what a great variety of forages we have. And so just thinking about some of our different classes of forages for our livestock, our warm season perennial grasses are gonna be like our Bermuda and our Bahia grass, our warm season annuals, um, that's gonna be like our crab grasses, cool, cool season perennials, we're thinking about our tall fescues, cool season annuals, of course, are our, like our annual rye grass, some of our wheats and oats, and then the, the queen of our forages, the legumes, come out to be our highest um, nutri nutritional value for our, our livestock. And so if we look at these forages across the board, for the most part, they're gonna meet us where we need them to be as far as nutrient requirements for our animals. And so we might not have to supplement as much as we think we do. So how does this look in a year where, we're, where it's been dry and you're telling me, Maggie, if that ground was too hard and I, and I couldn't get my cool seasons into the ground, or you don't typically plant a cool season annual and you do depend on hay for your winter needs. How are we going to be able to stretch that current supply of hay? Because it is a struggle we're all going to be looking at, especially come January and February when we're not thinking ahead that when we may not have as much hay as we think we need. And so the first thing we've got to do is, is we've got to calculate our hay needs and know the quality. And so when we actually put pen to paper, do we have enough hay to meet the minimum requirements of our herd for the next couple of months? And so if we take this 1,200 pound lactating cow on average milk production, we we're estimating she's going to eat about two and a half percent of dry matter of her body weight a day. And so that's 30 pounds of of dry matter. If we if our hay has tested out because because we we paid that $18 and we got that hay test. And we're, we figure that she needs about 33.3 pounds of hay as fed per day. And so think about our, our hay period. We're going to estimate that it, we're going to need to feed hay about 120 days before those spring forages pop up for us. And so for this winter feeding period, this cow alone is going to need almost 4,000 pounds of hay during that 120 days. And so that works out to be about five bales of hay per cow during this time. All right, five bales, that, that doesn't seem like a lot. That doesn't seem like too much. And, but when we look at it big picture wise for our whole herd, do we actually have enough? And so about 4,000 pounds of, of hay per cow for that time, over 40 cows, meaning I need almost 160 pounds, 160,000 pounds of hay for my herd during this time. And so just to kind of work that out in, in some smaller numbers, because that 160,000 scares me, that's about 80 tons of hay for the herd for that 120 days. And so in total, I need about 189 bales of hay for my herd. But wait, I'm here to tell you that you probably need a little bit more because we didn't think about the losses we might have in this hay. And so on average with storage losses, because we don't all have hay barns, we lose about 28% of our hay from storage loss. There's also going to be some feeding loss because we, we're not guaranteeing that they're going to eat every single bite of that hay out in the pasture. And so after hay losses, we're predicting that I'm probably actually going to need about 276 bales of hay for my herd over this 120 day winter feeding period. So we need to take a step back and think about the current supply that we have on hand. And before we even get into the quality of that hay, we have to ask ourselves, do we have enough hay to make it through the winter feeding months? And so, we figured out how much hay we, we think we're gonna need. We're looking out in our hay barn and, and do we have enough? What are some ways we might be able to minimize the waste on this hay supply and stretch what we currently have? And so just some simple management, some management strategies we can take in order to minimize this waste that might help us. And this might seem tedious, 
and it might take us a few extra minutes and we have to get off the tractor to do it. But in the long run, it's really gonna help us out. We first need to think about our feeder type. And so this picture here on the right, as you can see, that hay, that hay bale was probably just, just small enough to fit into that, that hay ring. And so a lot of that hay is spilling out on the ground and everything that's below them is most likely gonna be waste. They're gonna stomp that into the ground and waste, you know, five, six, up to 10% of that bale on us. And so maybe we think about investing in, in larger hay rings or the hay rings that, that kind of create a dome shape for us so that that waste falls down and remains in the hay ring and gives them an opportunity to eat it. It's also really important to think about our feeding location for our hay bales as well. We don't want to continuously put the bale in the same spot all winter long. That's just going to create a big mud hole that's going to tear up our pastures and cause even more waste as the winter feeding season goes on. So we want to avoid creating that mud hole. And we also want to think about options that maybe we unroll that bale out um, a little bit at a time. And again, that might that might cost us a few extra minutes while we're trying to get in and eat and eat dinner around supper time, but it might help us save some on the hay and make sure that our cattle are utilizing the hay that they need and not wasting it. It also could be a good time to look into limit feeding our hay. And so research has shown that restricting time to hay access can reduce waste up to 20%. And so maybe having it in, pinned up in the corral and, and offering them a couple hours each day to, to eat on that hay and then releasing them back out into the pasture might help us so that they're not just standing at the hay ring, stomping it into the ground and, and creating that big mess. Going back to feeding location, not just thinking about our, our hay supply, but thinking about our pastures as a whole as well. Spreading out that feeding location is gonna help spread out those nutrients that that waste does give us, give back to the pasture a little bit. And it might help us out in the long run as far as nutrient, um, nutrient management in our pastures as well. And so we know how much hay we have or how much, how much hay we have, how much hay we could estimate that we're gonna need. We're gonna think about our management strategies that are gonna help us not be wasteful with that hay. And then we have to consider our supplementation options. And these next few slides also can follow along as well if we do have grazing available to us, just knowing the quality of that hay is good, or that, that grazable forage is gonna be important. And so when we think about supplementing the cow herd, we have to recognize, like I said, I'm not telling y'all anything new, but that feeding the cow herd can be, and it probably is in most cases, the largest cost area for our farm. So balancing our supplementation program will be vital. And that starts with that forage test. Oftentimes, energy is going to be our most limiting factor with our, our forages, especially here in the southeastern part of the United States. And so it's very easy to say, oh, give that quality test back. Oh, I need to bump up crude protein a little bit. Let me throw out a protein tub. That's great. But did we really look and see if we were meeting our energy needs and maybe it was an energy supplement that we needed instead? And knowing all of this is going to help us compare the cost of our supplemental feed stuff. And so, like I said in the first slide, there are so many options as far as feeding goes. But we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to feed? When are you going to feed it? And how are you going to feed it? And so every operation that I go on and every operation in the United States are unique. And what you can handle is up to you. Just because it works for your neighbor down the road doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for you. So if investing in the tubs that go out in the pasture is easiest for you because you can put it out there and that your cattle are fed, um, are fed for a couple of weeks, or you're the kind of guy that likes to take the hand feed your cattle every day and take the bucket out in the field and it gives you a good time to look at your look at your your herd as a whole that's great what works best for you is important then you've got to think about what you can handle byproducts buying feed in bulk is awesome but if you don't have a good place to store it 
in large amounts, it may not be the best option for you. And so I say byproducts. We're very fortunate that our industry can utilize the waste of other industries to feed our animals, and that's great. And so these are some common byproducts that we see. Some popular ones, especially here in the southeast, are going to be our dried distillers grains. Um, here in the state of Arkansas, rice byproducts are very popular amongst our producers, especially in the Delta. And so it's also important to get those byproducts tested as well. So you understand what is what nutrient value is left in those and how they can help supplement your herd. And so knowing the options available for you to identify what is needed to achieve your goals and then what your feed is actually costing you. You also can't forget about our minerals and the use of technology such as ionophores in your feed because especially with our, our co or byproducts, the minerals can be larger issues. So making sure that your cattle have those, have those options available to them is very important. And so we've got our hay plan. Again, I'm, I'm focusing in on how dry some parts of our southeastern United States are right now. So what are some other management strategies we might have to consider going into our winter feeding period? Um, think about our intensive grazing management. And I say grazing and I mean it for grazable forages, stockpiles that we might still have out there, but I'm also referring to our hay as well making sure that we're feeding the needs of each group. So this might be the time that we prioritize our better quality hay or forages for those with higher needs. If we have some heifers we're developing, our cattle that are reaching peak lactation, or we're trying to help them recover so we can rebreed, they might be more important up the line than our dry cattle or say our bulls that we're just holding over into the spring recognizing the needs of each of our groups and prioritizing them if we need to. We might have a lot of hay left over from last year with a little bit lower quality. And so our dry cows or our bulls might be able to, to utilize that more efficiently with just a little bit of supplementation. And we might be able to put our better quality forages to our groups with higher needs. This is the time to recognize if we need to purchase extra hay. And most importantly, knowing where we're going to get it from if that is the case because we don't want to get to our cold wet January February March and be short on hay and not have an option of, of purchasing it there's going to be a lot of states that are in hay shortages this year so it's important to recognize now where you might need to to utilize getting it from this might be a time we need to take some more extreme measures and an early wean our calves and, and get them off the feed bill if needed. Um, I know our a lot of our, our spring spring calvers just finished up the fall weaning period and so those are now off the feed bill and so we might have to think about our stocking rates as a whole and this could be a great time to also go in and cull the herd. If she's not producing a calf for you, if she's constantly has a lower body condition score and takes a lot to recover, this might be the time to get her off the feed bill so that's one less body eating up our hay or our, our forages we have out in the pasture. And so thinking about that right now, the, the market is a little bit on our side these days. And so it might be time to take advantage of a high market and, and coal on the herd and prioritize those that need our better quality hay or our forages that we have in the pasture. And so just some, some final thoughts as, as we wrap up this, this talk this evening. Hay shortage, uh, we're all facing it right now, especially in the Southeast and, and things only seem to get drier. So it's important to have a plan and know if we have enough hay to get through right now or what steps we might need to take in order to make our hay supply stretch stretch where we need it to. Feeding cattle is dynamic. There are a lot of things that can go into it and it's unique to our operation. So it's important to recognize what we actually need and what we're actually willing to pay for. And so I go back to forage quality is worth something and forage testing is worth every penny. Again, at 18 to $20 is gonna be the best you spend in the next couple of months to really hone in and help you build your nutrition program for the next 
the next little bit. And so knowing your end goal, are we just trying to, to get some dry cows through the winter or are we trying to, to put some weight on some stalkers for the next couple of months? N building your nutrition program around that is very important. And then make sure you're, you're using the resources that are available to you. Um, our, our county agent system and our states are, are really great, making sure that you are using every opportunity, just like these webinars that NCBA offers us, make sure you're using them and those resources provided to you because there are lots of us out there that are very willing to help. And so that is all I have. If, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out. And, and I think Michaela had some time for questions here at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wilkie and Dr. Justice. That uh, was a fantastic presentation. Um, we do have some time for uh, for questions here. Um, we have and we have a, we have a couple questions for uh, for both of you, um, Dr. Wilkie uh, specifically. You so you talked quite a bit about the body condition scoring and um, and the importance of that. Uh, when when do you recommend uh, producers to to analyze and, and look at body condition score? You know, right after calving, you know, kind of throughout the year. Or what's your recommendation there? That's a great question, um, and I think um, right before calving is obviously one time um, because we know you know a month or so before calving is a good time because we know that once we go into lactation, those needs are going to get extremely high. And so if we need to make a change now prior to her having that calf is going to be a much easier time to, to make that change happen for her than um, after she calves is going to be. So that's that's one time that can be a good time to do it. Um, another time can be um, during the summer if, if it's a spring calving herd and they're out on grass and um, as Dr. Justice was talking, maybe you're in a drought and you're thinking about early weaning. Well, look at the condition of those cows and see if early weaning is, that might be another reason that you're contemplating early weaning is because you need to take lactation away from those cows um, and um, help them put on some weight simply by not having such a high requirement for them. So that's another good time. Um, and then you know, after after weaning and after those cows have had some time to put some condition back on, um, it's another good time to look at them and see who's put on some condition, who hasn't, and um, as a whole, are they doing better? Is it just a few cows that catch your eye? Um, is it the group in general so that uh, management plans need to be different or are we taking numbers down for cows that maybe um, aren't going to do so well throughout the rest of the winter now might be a good time for them to go that sort of thing great that's super helpful thank you and then uh dr justice um you shared a, a lot of um you know numbers that certainly caught my attention i and i'm sure i'm not speaking for myself there you know 160,000 pounds a day for a or 40 had heard, um, you know, that, that that's quite a lot. And then you and then you definitely emphasize, you know, the importance of for uh, forage testing. You know, I, I was wondering if you could share a little bit, you know, how can a producer obtain this test? Who should they reach out to? Um, you know, how, how is this test used? You know, just kind of share that um that perspective at all. Absolutely, Michaela. So so the, the first person I'm gonna tell you to to reach out to is is your county extension agent. And so um, most of our states through our, our awesome land grant universities are going to have the ability to, to test those forages for that nutritional value. And But outside of our, our university systems, there are several commercial labs that also test them uh, for about the same price that, like I said, I think around $20 is, is a good average to, to think about right now. And so those county agents are going to be able to help you get the get the sample correctly, whether that be through a hay probe for our our hay or our baleages or uh, showing you how to do a grab sample out in your pasture and then they can help you read the test once it comes back or reach out to your state specialist like myself that can help you um, help you understand that test and everything 
that is involved with it. And then that that's the first step to building our, our nutritional program. Like I said, knowing what uh, our crude protein and our energy is available in those forages and then go in from there. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I appreciate, you know, both of you putting the emphasis on, you know, uh, continuous improvement and educational efforts. Uh, so thank you both again for, for speaking tonight. Certainly learned a lot and, and took away a lot. Just real quick, um, we have another webinar this year, our end of year policy update from our DC team that is next month on December 7th. So hope everyone can, can join us again for that webinar. And then additionally, we have our uh, the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. We have some great producer education um, happening there. Uh, there's a grazing management workshop happening right before convention, the, the day before on that Tuesday, January 30th. And then we have Cattlemen's College happening all throughout convention and, you know, also a ton of education in the trade show with um, learning lounges, cattle chats, and the demonstration arena. Um, something that's really exciting is that as producers, you can attend uh, for free if you apply for the Rancher Resilience Grant. So it's a reimbursement program, but you are your registration and uh and your housing is covered. So please go to NCBA and check that out under the producer tab, Rancher Resilience Grant. Um, and if and if you have any questions, there is a contact e email on the website. So um, with that, everyone, thank you for being with us tonight. And hopefully everyone has a, has a good night. Thank you.